All right, here we go with week six, part B. We kept it under 30 minutes. It was tough, but we did it. We're going to start off with a couple of belt plays. Here we go. We have no problem with this call. Defender inside the belt, not aligned. He starts aligned, but then the receiver moves to the outside, and our defender here is kind of just happy to be here and run support. He made no effort to move with his receiver whatsoever, and this is a correct call by the back judge. He's just happy to be there, playing run support. This is a correct flag. We missed one here. Defender inside the belt, not aligned. Where is the umpire? We see where the umpire is. We know where the belt is. And at the snap, our defender here is inside the belt, not aligned. When these two, uh, excuse me, two defenders here switch coverages like this, they got to execute perfectly. But here, he's clearly inside the belt. He is not aligned on any receiver and we'd want a flag down. This is a challengeable play. So if we had a flag down, we'd confirm the call. If we didn't have a flag down and it was challenged, we could create the foul. Defender here is clearly inside the belt, not aligned. As the next nine plays will show, we're going to have to do a little bit better on our holding calls. We want quality holding fouls. If they affect the play, we got to have them. Let's take a look at nine plays from last week dealing with holding. If we check page 15 of the mechanics manual, it's got to be some slight adjustments here, but initially our official here should have that initial key. He's going to be here. Referee, well, he's got the ball carrier and the blocks at the point of attack. Now our two officials on the goal line, they've got to make sure the ball enters the field of play, so we've got that. And they're going to wind appropriately when the ball enters the field of play. Here it is. Then come off the ball and get the action in front of the runner. And you've got a clear look at that. Take down, very dangerous. And then we're going to see over here the block in the back. Clean look and the boarding into the walls afterwards. There's the block in the back. And as if the block in the back was not enough... Then the player has to board him right there. Last I checked, that was not allowed in football. Maybe allowed in hockey, but not so much in indoor football. So we've got a good look here. Whoa, hold on. Good look at that here. And a real good look at that boarding right up here. So we've got to have a couple flags down on the play. Remember, on these kick plays... We just need to focus and be on high alert for these holds, takedowns in the open field, blocks in the back, and then the garbage on the wall that we see right there. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Umpire is going to be all over this. That's one of his initial keys. We're going to have a almost throwdown at the point of attack right there. You can see the defender, the, well, the uh, receiving team player, grabs him and spins him, and that would have been a throwdown in the open field at the point of attack, except for the defender never fell down. Umpire sees it, recognizes, throws the flag, continues to officiate the play. Excellent. And here's one. We got two flags down on the field, a hold right out at the point of attack. We're going to see it right here. Again, this is almost a throwdown, except for the player didn't go to the ground. Right there at the point of attack, we want that, and we get two flags down. Good focus. On the kick plays, holes, blocks in the back. When we're talking about holding, this was graded as a marginal call. I think it should be an incorrect call, but you're going to see the left guard. He just rides the defensive end to where he wants to go. No feet are beat. That at the end here, he wants to go to the outside, and that's the way he goes. And the left guard just locks him and takes him and overpowers him to where he wants to go. Just because there's a grab doesn't mean there is a foul. Think of the categories. Grab and steer is not a category of holding. Grab and restrict is. Here, no restriction. He just takes him to where he's going, and this is a big nothing. Here, our DB is going to beat his receiver, and the receiver holds. 
DB gets around him, and there is the restriction. It is slight, but effective. It is at the point of attack, and the receiver just pulls him down ever so slightly. Right there. That is enough, and we got to have a flag down on this. That's big. Would have called back this score. The DB beats his blocker, and there's the restriction right at the point of attack. There it is. Grab and restrict. This is a foul. Sometimes we just can't get out of our own way and we are our own worst enemy. Here, three officials, a monster hold. You're going to see the left guard turn the defensive end, allow the runner to get the corner and score. We got a touchdown. We've got six eyes looking at that. How do we create ourselves a problem? Now, we've got a red hot coach because his team was just scored upon and there was a huge hole at the point of attack in front of everybody and the whole arena could see it and now we got to pop that coach with a sideline warning correctly you shouldn't be out there but you see how we create our own problems how do we miss a hold in the open field like that on a scoring play turns them puts them in the ground and gives them the corner and a score next up three plays dealing with illegal defenses does this jump out at the umpire? Linebacker not stationary at the snap. Correct call. Pre-snap, umpire mechanics, six yards. He's in the backer's hip pocket, perfect position to see the foul. Linebacker not stationary at the snap. Correct call. This is a five-yard penalty. It is not an automatic first down. And uh, we can see the umpire sees it, flags it, and continues to officiate the play. Nice job. Correct call, nose guard, out of his stance at the snap. He gets out of his stance, doesn't even try to get back into it. This is a correct call. Indoor mechanics are much different from outdoor mechanics, and I appreciate most everybody's hard work and determination in learning and performing our mechanics. They are designed to put you in the correct position to rule on the play. So keep working hard at the mechanics, and i got six plays for you this week. Take a look at the back judge on this play. Good job hustling to move under the upright to get a better look at the field goal attempt. Exactly what we want. Move when you need to move. Nice job. Tough camera parallax, but this right defensive end was warned earlier in the game to tighten up his alignment. Here, the back judge checks it, and he rules the defensive end is outside shoulder to shoulder. He's been warned once. Flag it, as the back judge does. Good job. Per the mechanics manual, where does our referee line up? He's to be three yards outside the guard. The referee himself makes the determination of what the three yards is, and if we have a stationary receiver inside the referee, as we do here, this is a foul at the snap for illegal formation. This is a play that may be challenged, and if this play were challenged, the call on the field, illegal formation, would be confirmed. Remember, referees, we call this tight. We do not warn on this. On the other side of the field, if we had the formation, it would be the back judge's call, and we warn once. Referee side, correct call here. No warning, flag it. If it went to replay, we'd confirm the call. Short field goal scrimmage kick mechanic. So our referee's got the ball flight. Our H, you got your initial line play, then you've got kicker holder. Line judge, same thing. Initial line play, and watch what happens here. We want all holds that are takedowns in the open field thrown. Even though there's no effect on the play here, we've got a throwdown in the open field. Definitely need a hold call. We could even support a personal foul there, depending on how the player has been behaving during the day. But we cannot tolerate any of those throwdowns in the open field. We need a flag. Let's take a look at the umpire. First, he's going to set the belt, and it looks like he only has one backer at the back of the box, so he doesn't have to worry about pointing. Then backer number two aligns at the back of the uh, belt right there, and uh, our umpire now has to point. Remember, umpires, if you only got one at the back of the belt, you don't have to point. Here, the second one moves up to the back of the belt, so go ahead and point. Good mechanics. Pre-snap, umpire mechanics, six yards. He's in the backer's hip pocket, perfect position to see 
the foul. Linebacker not stationary at the snap. Correct call. This is a five-yard penalty. It is not an automatic first down. And uh, we can see the umpire sees it, flags it, and continues to officiate the play. Nice job. The next seven plays jump all over the place. Why? They are our weekly, or our part two weekly, reminder type plays. Let's take a look. Here's an interesting play. Remember rule 8-4-B-4, which states, a motion receiver may not block a defensive lineman. And that's what he's going to do. So that is a foul. However, the motion receiver false started, so the crew correctly shut this down as a false start and not an illegal block. Uh, the illegal block did not occur because we had the false start. So any time we would flag that is if it was some sort of a personal foul, even though we had the false start, we could always hit him for a personal foul. But here, it never occurred because we had the false start. This is the first play from scrimmage. What's it say in the foul report? Special, 1420 in the first. I warned both guards to move up. That's exactly what we want. The warnings, record it in the foul report, and then start flagging them. Three in motion, we all know, is a false start. Now here, what's it say in the foul report? Special, at 9.45 in the first, I told number nine to move back, which is why he was moving at the snap. Therefore, no foul for three in motion. Arguably, he was moving back backwards while the other two forward motion receivers were rolling. Probably would never want to call that. It's too insignificant. But the point of this video is the wing down here at the bottom told him to move back. So even if that movement was more pronounced moving back and the other two receivers were moving forward, we would not flag it. And more importantly, note it in the foul report what you did. This play tells us you got to be thinking every single play. You got to be focused. For example, what if we have jet motion and the quarterback shovels the ball forward and the ball comes out? We've got an incomplete pass, correct? Well, what happens here? We're going to have an interception. The interceptor is going to start his return and then he's going to throw an illegal forward pass. Here it comes. Illegal forward pass that hits the ground. Why aren't we killing this? We got an incomplete illegal forward pass. Now the crew banged it correctly, but why aren't we shutting this play down? Interception, illegal forward pass, which is actually incomplete, so let's kill it. Stay on your keys for what? Two seconds. You're going to see the foul back judge's key. Let's do the count. Stay on your keys. One, one thousand, two, boom, there's the foul, illegal contact. Again, stay on your keys. Two seconds, you're going to see the foul. That's all we ask. One, one thousand, two, one, boom, there it is. Here we go with another rules explanation. If the ball carrier's helmet comes off, the ball is dead. If the player is not the ball carrier, the ball remains alive, but the player... Okay, why do these people got to be bothering me? The player whose helmet comes off, I think it's going to be this player here, he must not continue to participate in the play beyond the immediate action in which he is engaged. So let's see what happens. His helmet's ripped off, he continues to engage this player here, and once he disengages, he stops. The foul is prolonged participation, which is a personal foul, okay? Because by definition, that guy's out of the play. But here, he's engaging in the immediate action with the player who kind of ripped his helmet off, or however it came off. We don't know, nor do we care, unless it's a personal foul, of course. But he can participate in the immediate action, which is all he's doing here. He's only tangling with the player he initially engaged and then he goes back and picks up his helmet and then we pop him with a foul. This is not a foul. Know the rules. 9-1-17 NCAA. Prolonged participation is a personal foul. If the player is not the ball carrier, 
Sure, the ball remains alive, but he must not continue to participate in the play beyond the immediate action, which did not occur here. This is an incorrect call. On this play, we're going to have some excellent rules knowledge. It's fourth and three. What is the rule? When it is fourth and two or less, the belt reduces to the line to gain. Our two linebackers are thinking, oh, it's fourth and three. We can step up. No. The rule is fourth and two or less. The line to gain reduces. Here, umpire, well aware of the rules, pulls the backers back to five. The rule is fourth and two or less, not fourth and three. Excellent rules knowledge by our umpire. And we'll close out Part B, Week 6, with five plays from The Longest Yard. Let's take a look. Heads on a swivel. Let's watch the action between these two players. They think they're starring in The Longest Yard. We don't get this kind of nonsense. It only escalates. Here the player grabs him inside the ear hole, throws him down by his hair. Referee focused behind the ball. Remember, the play is not over until the players separate. Ball's well away, grabs him by the hair and puts him on the ground. Got to get this or it's going to escalate. Great job. End of the play here at the bottom of the wall. The runner is forced into the wall by opponent contact and boom. Excess hit, number 30, coming in after the play with the contact right in front of the line judge here. He sees it, and he flags it, and then the player is like, Who? Me? Good call. Down here, we're going to have a foul for a 914 and possibly a 913 target. The player receiving this block was injured. If it's close, you've got to throw a flag, even if you're late with it. Remember, there's no disqualifying on a target. It's a safety foul. We've got to get it. Here it comes. Whoops, right down in here. Clear as day. And on the foul report, the crew said, we got together and said we had a possible blindside hit that we might have missed. If you're coming in here discussing this, that we might have missed it, then you missed it. If it's close, flag it. This is player safety. So even if we had a flag late after the conference, that would be fine. we got to get these safety fouls, 100% of them. And remember, if the crew is talking about it, you're damn well sure it probably occurred, and you should have had a flag down. Here's a classic 9-1-3 targeting, which the older officials used to remember as spearing. And 9-1-3 is no player shall target and make forcible contact against the opponent with the crown of his helmet. And, of course, you have to have an indicator of targeting, which we have here. So let's slow it down. And, again, this is 9-1-3 targeting, which does not require a defenseless player. Here, the indicator is you can see the DB lower his head before attacking, and he initiates the forcible contact. This defender has absolutely no idea what he's about to hit. He just attacks with the crown of his helmet. This is classic 913 targeting, and we got to have a flag down on this. Now, this is the same play we just saw, and what we're going to see is the uh, ball carrier is going to make his catch, and his forward progress is stopped. Let's see it. He's going to make the catch. Right there. He's stonewalled and driven back two or three yards, and the crew should have blown it dead. Now, if we rewind a little bit, I want you to watch, I think it's number 67 coming from about 15 yards away. This player right here. What's 67 going to do? He's going to sprint 15 yards downfield, launch himself, and make forcible contact to the head or neck area of number 55 right there. And that is targeting right there. Our referee, as you're going to see, he's back here. He sees that action. He has it as an unnecessary roughness. So we do want to flag down, but what happened? Referee didn't stick to his convictions, and he allowed the crew to talk him out of this flag. So clearly... We've got forward progress stops, so that's problem number one, that we didn't blow this thing dead. 
and then we've got the uh, this this uh, launch. The referee flags it, and then the crew talks them out of it. Now we understand it's tough here. This is one of the holes in the mechanic. We're snapped outside the 15. It's tough to get goal line coverage. We're not going to fault the back judge here. The back judge has the action over here, so he's got to stay on the back wall, and he can't get up until the last second to the goal line. However, the crew should see that forward progress has been stopped and the whistle should have blown. Now let's continue to watch, and we're going to see 67. He's going to come from a far distance away, and what you got to remember is, so there's the first target. That would be an injection in NCAA, but number 67 here, okay? Officials must be mindful when you see one player sprinting and everyone else is walking or jogging, or one player is going to the opposite direction as everybody else, this is the player with the brick in his hand. This is the one you need to be watching closely for the potential fouls like the blindside blocks, the late hits, the targeting. And clearly, this guy here is the player with the brick in his hand, and our referee spotted this from a distance, but decided not to stay with his call. Now, even if this was not to the head or neck area, and this is, this is a launch, this is contact right up with the crown to the head, right there. That is a foul. Even if it were not to the head or neck area, when we see something like this, certainly this is an unnecessary roughness. But here we got a launch, and NCAA, that too would be an ejection. So we'd have two players ejected on this play if this were NCAA. One from the defense, one from the offense. Both of these targetings would be created in replay. We don't eject, though, for targeting. There's targeting one. That's the uh, old-fashioned spear, just leading with the crown of the helmet. Doesn't matter if he's defenseless. And here we go, number 67 with the brick in his hand. He's got the launch, and he leads with the crown right up into the head. And that is foul number two. We've got to have flags down on this. So when you make these calls, remember, we're going to support them if they're close. I just have no idea what was going on here that this crew was able to talk the referee out of this correct call. It makes no sense. But we got to have flags down on like this. And 67, he's carrying the brick, going against the flow. Got to be on the lookout for something like this. And that, my friends, is a wrap for week six. It was a long week, and we got another long week coming up. We got five games this weekend. And remember, if you're working, we're kind of like the NHL, go Caps, in that just about everybody's going to make the playoffs. So in week seven, we got ten teams, and all ten are still fighting for a playoff spot. Keep that in mind when you're working, 100% focus. Work hard, perform your mechanics, have a great game. If you're off, enjoy your time off, and I'll talk to you next week.